Good evening, guys and girls. Welcome back to Malaysian Architecture Student um, Education Online Series, proudly presented by MASA. Hope you guys are doing well, and thank you again for joining us for tonight. So for those who are new, let me introduce what MASA is. MASA stands for Malaysia Architecture Student Alliance. It is a non-profit student uh, committee acting directly under uh, PAM, which is the Putuban Architect Malaysia, consisting of student representatives from all architecture institute in Malaysia. During this time of MCO, MASA and PAM have decided to launch this online lecture series for students to be more productive and gain more insights. Architect Argyanta is the head of PAM Education and Dr. Zach Zaro is the convener. Is the convener. My name is Guma Sylvester, a MASA representative from UCSI, and I will be your MC for today, for tonight actually. Uh, so introducing our next speaker, Architect Hoi Jun Wang, also known as Ashi, with his topic on typology of sustainable design. So a bit of an introduction for on the speaker. He's cu currently a uh, lecturer uh, teaching in Taylor's University, Malaysia, who teaches in part one and part two architectural programs. He is also a principal at uh, of JW Hoy Architects and as well as managing director at Actual Design Architects. Moreover, he's a corporate member of Lumaga Architect Malaysia and a strategic researcher on sustainability and volumetric, CREAM and CIDD. So he has completed his master's, master's in science, integrated sustainable design, part two from Edinburgh University and part one from the University of Malaya. He has also worked on a book uh, entitled uh, Architecture Kalang, uh, sorry, uh, Singapore Kalang Sustainable Planning uh, National University of Singapore. So his niche and passion for sustainable design are evidently shown in his research work and publications and also presentation. Okay, so sit back and relax. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the talk. But if you have any questions during uh, the sharing, feel free to type them in the uh, chat box in Facebook so we can attend them at the end of the sharing. Okay, so without further ado, let's welcome uh, architect Hoi Jun Wang. Hi, how are you tonight? Hi, hi, hi Kuma. Thank you for your introductions. Cool, hope you are doing well. And I will pass the floor to you now. Okay, thank you. All right, cool. All right. Um, I guess everyone can see the slide. Uh, thank you for Kuma, uh, this very kind introductions. Um, thank you for Masa and Pam. You know, sub, support the talk. Uh, this is my pleasure to share uh, some some of my ideas and research on this topic, typology of sustainable design. So I humbly sharing what I know with you. Um, I think just now we are, Akuma already gone through my bio data. Um, I just want to introduce my my mandos. Uh, in sustainable design, actually, uh, first. First person is a Dr. King Yang. Uh, I worked with him uh, in my early in my uh, early career, so he inspired me a lot on the sustainable design. Uh, second was a Jimmy Lim. Jimmy Lim, maybe for most of the young architect students, uh, not familiar with uh, with him. Uh, he he was the Aka Khan Award uh, Award winner uh, during I think nineties. So he, his approach uh, has influenced a lot of our local, uh, especially for bungalow design, green design. And the third person is uh, Dr. Nermal Krishnani. He, he's, his was my studio master during my time in NUS. Uh, he's a very important person, uh, especially in the Asia sustainable design applications and theory. And he wrote a book called Greening Asia. We always we always call this book is a Bible of sustainable design. Um, and he also editor of Future Arc magazine. I think, I think some of you know this magazine. Now, before we, we start in the topic, let reflect on a few questions. On this sustainable topic, right? Can we move toward a sustainable way of living? Or sustainable way of living is just a whole ha thingy. Is it achievable or is it just a theory? Okay. The second question is, 
What is the problem actually? Why sustainable agenda is a must? Uh, in, in, in practice, in school, we always you know, make a sustainable agenda is a must in your studio project. But what is really the problem? See, the, the, okay, the third question is, is green an affordable movement? Or green is something very expensive. Uh, a lot of people thought green building is more expensive than the normal design building. Yeah, the green, the hybrid car, you know, the car or electric, electricity car is more expensive than a petrol car. Means that green, if you put a green label on it, anything, it makes the things more expensive. So is it a green is only for rich people of game? You know, normal people, they cannot afford it. So is it a green and really affordable movement? Okay, so I start with these three questions. Now, the truth is that we, we, our system is unsustain, unsustainable. Why? Because we open wasteful use of non-renewable resources and pollutions. So there are two key questions here. Wasteful and non-renewable on the resources and the pollutions. Now, there's a 76% of the energies is consumed by building. 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the buildings. 12% of the national water is consumed by the building. So who responsible on these figures? Yep, you and me. Why? Because we are the building consultants or we are the designer of the building. Yep, developers, they're also responsible on this, these figures. In other words, is as an architect, we are playing a very important role to design something sustainable. Otherwise, the buildings will take most of the energies or resources from the planet. Yeah, that's why we are here to, to talk about this topic. Now, that is a breakdown. In Singapore, the the building related uh, sectors that consume energies is building, factories, uh, infrastructure like transport, uh, house, households. So it's consumed most, uh, more than 50% of, uh, of the sectors. And you look at the residential sectors that we design condo, we design house, we design bungalow, right? We need to understand what is the breakdown of the energy usage in the household. And this is from the Singapore as well. Uh, air conditioning, 30%, refrigerator, 70%, lighting, 10%, water heater, 9%. So the temperature control usage, right, is consumed almost 40% of the overall. And the lighting is consumed 10%. Means that these two, these two, and these two things, right, is, to, is the thermal comfort uh, sectors. If a designer can tackle these two issues, it's way better than you buy a very energy saving iPhone. Yeah, maybe the iPhone only costs a 5% or less than 5% of the total energy use. So we need to tackle the, the real problem. If we can do, if we can design the buildings, more ventilation, more natural ventilation, more natural lighting, right? We can save a lot of energies. Now, unsustainable is part of our system now for the last, not now, sorry, for the last hundred years since we discovered the oil in 150 years ago. Yeah, and it changed our landscape totally and it seems not stopping still. So you can see in a very nice scenes landscape, and then we have a big factories you know, to produce a, and it will produce a petroleum, etc. So this is a landscape that we've seen. And back to Malaysia, we also have a um, scenes like this. This is in Yipo. You know, Yipo, if anyone uh, from Yipo, I'm from Yipo. This is my hometown. This is a limestone mountain. Uh, in Yipo, so you will go, go if you uh, go toward to Yipo from Kuala Lumpur. This is a scene you see. And what's a limestone for? The limestone is for marbles. And uh, if you're architect, uh, will you spec a marble as a materials for the bungalow? 
you know, for the kitchens. So if yes, right, then you are one of the contributors of this uh, landscape. Yeah. So we we are using the the resources from the planets, uh, and this is a farming activities. A farming activities cause open burning, because this method is the is the widely used in some countries. Uh, this is a very low cost fertilizing strategies. However, it is a very high cost for the environment and human public health. And before the before the COVID, if some if some of you will still recall, right? Almost every year we have a haze issues. Yeah. And pollution is worse than the COVID-19. Why? Because pollution has no boundary. Yeah. We cannot cross the border to stop the haze. We cannot social distancing and the pollution get away from us. So they have nowhere to control pollution. This is even harder battles compared to the COVID-19. So we need to take it very seriously. And the chart showing us, right, the, this is a global energy consumption by fossil fuel, means non-renewable energy. It keeps arising. So there are no syndrome that is slowing down. And it, it keeps going. It keeps going uh, as an economy keeps going growth. Okay, we put in the country perspective. As we can see, the country who are more advanced, more developed, actually the energy usage is more. If we put in the perspective of uh, energy consumption per capita, and we can see that the top, you know, one of the top is uh, Singapore, and then following by United Arab, and then U United States, Japan, and then uh, Malaysia and China, indeed is, uh, is the lowest, yeah. So, so this, uh, a lot of people thought, oh, Singapore is a very green city, uh, but we have to look at different perspective. The stereotype on the Singapore is a very green city, yes, but indeed because of lifestyle, because of the materials, the use, because of the infrastructures, so their per capita oil consumption is way higher than most of the countries. The truth is, the second truth is, resources available to support our human life has been reduced by population growth. What does it mean? Our populations growing, um, the ecological footprints will be more demand. This is called uh, strangled earth. Means the populations versus the lifestyle. Now, this is ecological footprint, hectare of land per capita. Means that we take all the land of this planet divided by the total population of the world. And then this is what we get in 1900, in years 1900, averagely we got 7.9 hectares per capita. And then in 2030, we are projecting 1.69 hectare per capita. This, this is the only land to support per capita lifestyle. All our uh, living, our clothes, you know, our food, beside the fish, all, most of the food, most of the materials, the marbles, the concrete that we use is all excavated from the land. Means that in 2030, we only have 1.69 hectares per capita to support our life. Now, in today, right, the ecological footprint hectares per land of land per capita in USA is 9.5 hectare. What does it mean? Nine point means that uh, America lifestyle, they need 9.5 hectare to support their lifestyle. Whereas UK 5.8, China is 2.3, India is the least, which is a 1.3 hectare of land. Now, I'll give you another perspective. Now on the right, on the left hand side is America. Most of the American towns, they stay in big house, they're driving a big car, you know, SUV, MPV. And on the right hand side is a photo taken in China, one of the China villages. So can you see that if just a small footprint, they, these people can live already, you know, they just the, the house or I don't know this called a house or called a room or called a bed. It's so small. And 
And if you compare to the America, right, the carbon footprint is very different. And this is what we call the lifestyle, the ecological footprint is very is higher in the advanced country compared to some um, least developed countries. However, in China, the China ecological footprint growing at 4% per year. And 4% per year means that 100 million hectares of new land per year. What does it mean? In 20 years ago, in Beijing, most of the people are bicycles. And now if you go to Beijing, most of them are taking tram or high-speed rail, driving a big car, sport car, you know. In the old days, maybe they just eat normal food, rice, but now they want to take a lot of meats or steak because the lifestyle is evolving. So every year, they need 100 million hectares of new land to support their lifestyle. And the truth is, the world population is keep increasing. In 2020, it's 7.8 7.8 billion. So can you imagine? In 2030, we are talking about maybe 8.2 billion. 2040, talking about 9 billion. So how can the planet sustain? So for the next generations like you, you know, a lot of young, young people here. So in the next 10 years, your lifestyle will be more and more uh, intentions compared to the old days, our you know, father generations. Maybe your car will be a lot smaller. Your house is a lot smaller. Yeah. Last time people can stay in the big house and landed house. And now the young people only barely can afford a small condo unit. Now, this is how the lifestyle change due to the population's growth and the limited resources. And this is a serious issues that we need to deal with. That's why it's sustainable is a must, it's an urgent uh, topic that we need to look at. Now, I will share you a uh, videos. One call me nature. Others call me mother nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years, 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. When I falter, you falter. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans, my soil, my flowing streams, my forests, they all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you When I falter, you falter. Um, sorry, uh, uh, I need to share it. Yes, sorry. Others call me Mother Nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years. 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. 
When I falter, you falter. Or worse. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans, my soil, my flowing streams, my forests, they all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me. One way or the other, your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature. I will live. I am prepared to evolve. Are you? Right. So nature don't need people, but we do need nature. Um, uh, maybe some of you seen this video before. Uh, and this is a very serious question. Uh, whether sustainable agenda is a must. I think all the data have shown us the, the fact and the truth. And we are not fighting for our anyone's. Actually, we're fighting for ourselves. Uh, especially young generations. Uh, why the young generations have more interest in, in sustainable design is because you are fighting for your own future. Yeah. So we need to come up with the system solutions. Uh, the, we want to create a framework and design approach for integrated urban development for delivering required performance. So as the designer, we need to set our framework to uh, solve this problem and design is our skill and our deliverables and what the deliverables we need to achieve the performance so performance is the key words in order to talk about the framework um, I recommend or I share with you uh, we can learn from the natures because all the answer is from the natures so these are 10 principles of uh, biomimicry and this is suggested by uh, Jenny Benyos, is a biomimicry expert. So she laid down with the 10 principles what the natural uh, design strategies like. The first is the diversity and cooperate, cooperate, use waste as a resources, gather and use energy efficiently, optimize, not maximize, use materials sparingly, clean up, not pollute, do not draw down, resources remain in balance in biosphere, run on the information, use local resource. Now, we because due to the time constraint, I, I can't go through one by one. Uh, maybe you just select few. Like for example, diversity and corporate. corporate. Um, as you know, in the, in the jungle or in the forest, within one, for, one small footprint, you can see the different fauna and fauna they have a different animals, you know, they are monkey, they have an insect, they have a different plants, they live together. They're very diversified. Yeah, they never kill the rest of the beings and only my own. I'm conquered this area. The rest of the beings don't come. So they don't have such thing. And all these beings, they cooperate with each other. Yeah, the tree provides a habitat to a monkey, maybe the monkey, the, you know, they, 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 they take care of the space. So they cooperate with each other. So in our societies, likewise in our societies, we need to have a diversified program, diversified educations, uh, people live together. We, have, we, we, need, we need to diversify pro, uh, the progress of businesses, you know, and especially in sustainable design. Sustainable design, not longer being carried on just by architects itself. We need to cooperate with different expertise like engineers, landscaper, gardeners, the rest of the stakeholders. So we need the joint uh, ideas and joint discussions in order to come up with sustainable design. And the second one is like use waste as a resources. 
Use waste as resources is what we call cradle to cradle. We recycle the materials. Uh, in the in the natures, right, you never see there is any waste. Yeah. Do you ever see monkey produce a trash and then uh, throw in the jungle and make the jungle very uh, unpleasant? No. In jungles or in forests, in natures, they never have a waste. All the waste will turn into resources, we turn into something else. So this is what we learn from the natures, crater to crater, that from the raw materials, when you manufacture, you do you make it in something else. When the end of the life, you have to reuse it or recycle it, you know, or we compose to recover the land. So this is all we learn from the natures. Sure, there have many others, you know, strategies like for some, for example, um, optimize, not maximize. I think this is a, something very, uh, very important. In, in nature, they never maximize things. Like for example, animals, when, they're, when they take the food, when the enough is enough, they won't go in to uh, pick more food and keep it in, into their nest. They won't. So they won't pick up all the durian, you know, the, the squirrel just take enough durian, that's it. But human is different. Our human uh, uh, system is we want to maximize, not optimize. You know, we, we want to, if we earn money, we want, we want to earn more money, even though more than enough. You know, I want to maximize my, my resources, not optimize my resources. I think something that we need to learn from the matrix. And use materials sparingly, we need to, understand, we need to uh, think on the materials, uh, whether it's sustainable, whether it's replaceable, renewables. Like clean up, not pollute. Natures never pollute the environment. They always have a mechanism to clean up uh, the water or clean up the air, especially the plants. And um, after trial, run, run on information. This is something also uh, very interesting things that we can we can learn from. All the natures beings, they they run on the information. For example, the trees, they know exactly when the when the leaf had to be fall, now when when their leaf had to be grow up, even though the frog they know when 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 is uh, uh, raining days and when when is the uh, winter, so they have to keep themselves warm, etc. So all the beings or all the in the matrix, right, all all of them are running on informations. And this is the chart that I I I like to present you. Uh, this is my uh, research on how to evolve or how to transform an uh, existing city into an uh, eco-cities. Um, if you talk about new design cities like Cyber Jaya or Putra Jaya, sure you can design whole new brands of city and make it green. But however, majorities of the cities in Malaysia, in the world, right, is uh, existing cities. So our challenge is how to transform our existing cities, not how to design a new cities. The challenges is much more uh, greater in the existing cities. So I, I, I come up with the ring. First of all, we have to divide the city into different infrastructures. The great infrastructure, green infrastructure, water, water is a blue infrastructure, and then the policy and culture is red infrastructure. I think this color infra this color infrastructures is uh, first proposed by Dr. Ken Yang. Uh, it's called eco, ma eco master plans. Uh, but what, what I what I do is Okay, I focus on these infrastructures and we do it one by one. Now, the first step is we need to do site analysis. Now, students, when you do the studio, right, the first thing your lecturers ask you to do is a site analysis. So what you what you try to what you try to do in a site analysis, you need to gather all the information from the different infrastructures. You need to do mapping, data corrections, mathematical study, correlation with the study bureau to get all the information to get raw data and then analyze it, yeah? And then the next step is develop a great assessment tools. Uh, now, this is what I try to propose. Uh, a lot of green design or, or redesigner, right? We always look for the green assessment tools like GBI, like Greenery, but no one talk about great assessment tool. For the existing city or existing building, right? We need to understand what is a problem first before we can propose a green strategies to the cities. So great assessment tool is for us to diagnose the problem of the cities. Once we know, like for example, if you talk about waste, site analysis, we know waste network or recycle rate. What is the rate? 
a recycle rate in these cities. But in grid assessment tool, we want to talk about what is the waste pollution? How bad is it the recycle management? What is the lacking? So that is a grid assessment tool. And then after that, you in the yellow ring, then you can, you can, you can pick the strategies like replacing, rebuilding, re-eventing, reductions, et cetera, to fix the problem. And the next thing is you need to set a target for eco cities in 20 years. Yeah, in 20 years, Kuala Lumpur is become neutral, neutral carbon cities. Yeah, in uh, five years' times, I want to increase the recycle rate of this city to 50%. Yeah, I want to increase the public transport using rate to 80%. So this is the eco city targets. All these targets is customized, you know. We cannot you know, we cannot just uh, copy the Putrajaya back to the KL. Uh, we cannot copy the Singapore version back to KL. No, we need to ha have our own versions and we are look at the city itself. What is the potentials and what is a problem and how far it can go. So this is called eco, uh, I, well, I call it eco city uh, chart. Uh, this to help us, right, have a framework, how to transform the cities for assisting cities toward the eco cities. And the next studies I did is a sustainable design type projects uh, because throughout the uh, practice or, or my study, I found that a lot of people have uh, questions on what is sustainable design actually. What kind of building is the is a standard screen design? A lot of people thought if you design a building with a lot of greens, that is a green buildings. If you design a building with solar panels, wind turbines, then that is a sustainable design. But is that true? Yeah, is there only ways that we are designed a sustainable design? Uh, not really. So what I found, what I found that I try to uh, organize it into four different uh, streams. One, the first one is the eco architecture, ecology architectures, and the second one is the green architectures. Third one is the energy saving design. The fourth one is the conservation projects because conservation also part of the sustainable design. Now the ecological architectures is the deep green. Yeah. Well, Ken Yang last time he, he come up with the with the words for deep green or light green, you know, how green you can you you you, you can go for one project means that you need to put how many resources into the projects. So eco architectures it designed the whole ecosystems. It involves a lot of uh, investment, a lot of capitals. And we are looking at the infrastructure changing. We're looking at to create the bioclimatic. Now the green architectures, it's more on the green means the landscape, you know. Uh, they have two approach. What is a great green, new green? The no green, you create a whole new green. So it involves more capitals. And the new green is talking about vertical greens, either vertical or horizontal greens. The second approach is the preserved greens, means the green is there, so we just preserve it. Uh, so we are more on existing green. Now, energy saving design have two approach. One is the passive design, means that you are studying all the en environment or natural elements, like natural lighting, building orientations, natural ventilations, is a passively work. Energy design, the second approach is proactive designs. It involves a lot of capitals, means you use a lot of advanced technologies like geothermals, photovoltaic, wind turbine management system, etc. So this is called proactive design. And the conserv conservation the projects, I'm not going, uh, I mean, in deep in today, uh, is, is more on the preservation, either you preserve the building or you regenerate the building program itself to re reuse it back. Now, different approach, we need a uh, different knowledge. So like for example, design ecosystems, you need an urban study like this. You need to know what is the environment, those, what is the habitats of the flora and fauna. Create a new green, preserve the green, you need, you need a landscape study. The energy design, you need to understand the environmental climate and proactive design, you need to know engineering study and uh, preservations, uh, preserv preservations or conservation projects, you need to know the history, historical study. So it means that 
do they sustainable design is no longer a, a single professional's uh, thingy. We need to cross disciplinary. We need to learn different knowledge like urban landscape, environmental engineering. So to equip ourselves to produce or design a green, a green building. And different approaches will lead you to different outcome. Yeah, like uh, deep green with eco ecological uh, architectures, you, you will see this mostly as a township project. Uh, green, green design, you create a new green, so you can see a building have a lot of greens. And if an existing green, right, preserve green, normally you will see the environmental is, is greener. Yeah, the building is a lightly touched. Uh, minimize the green with pink. The, the additional, I mean, the green, new green, right? We want to maximize the green area. And the passive design, we want to minimize the energy consumptions. And the active design, we want to maximize the energy generations. So this is the ultimate goal or strategies of the uh, different sustainable typologies. Well, I'll give you some, uh, show you some precedent study. Now, this is the ecological architectures. This is a case study in Bishan Park, Singapore. The government spent 76 million. Uh, this is a drainage, it's a concrete drainage. It's a very common in the city center, especially in KL, we, we see a lot of this. And you know, the, the governments hire a landscape architect to lead this infrastructure changing program. So it changed a whole infrastructure, it changed a drainage into a stream. So you redesign the whole ecosystem, you create a bioclimatic, and this is the urban skill planning. This was a, this was a um, drainage concrete, and it created a park here. Yeah. So this is the, this is the videos. I can show you how, how, how it's go. Cool. Okay, so this is a drainage. This is a concrete drainage. So it keep evolving, it bypass. After bypass, it create a new park there. Yeah, make it faster. So when you bypass, you see a concrete drainage still there. And when I bypass, it take off the concrete and make the concrete part as a green area and make a whole valley. And this is how the river like. This is how it look, it's look like today. So we always believe that it's still safe, uh, it's just safe uh, serve the same functions, which is uh, to take care of the storm water. But with the landscape, with the valley, right, it's a more flexible. So in the normal days, right, it still can serve the ecosystems. Yeah, whereas the concrete drainage is only functions during the raining days. So when the normal days, this drainage is not functions at all. So it take out our space, it's not really effective or you know, performance, performance wise, it's not, uh, it's not performance enough, which we say, because like this, we can serve for the environment, we can serve the ecosystem, we can serve for well beings, you no know, people enjoy it the wildlife come back to the cities. And this is how we take out the infrastructure, the concrete infrastructure and turn into the green infrastructure. And this is a, one of the very successful uh, projects. Yeah, you will like this kind of environment rather than concrete drainage, right? Yeah. Okay. Back in. So Bishan Park. Now we need to create this kind of environment for the people to enjoy. If our generations, if our people right, never touch the water, never touch the landscape, right, they never appreciate it, especially for the kids. And nowadays, all the kids are playing iPad, watching YouTube in a condo. They are, they are hardly play or you know, understand how the natural work. So how, what do you think they can, they will protect the environment when they grow up? 
there are no, there are no emotion attached at all. They don't understand what's the function of the metric at all. And because of these projects, uh, the, all the authors uh, come back to the cities. Uh, however, because it's a Singapore, so they ask you, do not, do not touch or chase the authors, do not talk loudly, do not feed the authors. So this is a, uh, this is a I'm not saying a problem, but this is something that we can think of. We want natures, but our, 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 I mean, you know, nowadays people don't know how to deal with natures. When we see author, we don't know how to deal with author. We want natures, but we don't like monkey. We don't like mosquito. We complain if the monkey. So I think we need to change our, our mindset. You know, if we want to, the natures, we need to embrace the, the natures 100%. So we need to learn how to deal with the natures again. Now, in Malaysia, we also have a liver alive. Uh, some of you know that. But is that liver or life or liver or light? I keep complaining this is, uh, I don't know whether today has uh, any architects involved in these projects. Now, what, what the liver or life you know, did is um, they, they proposed a coin pond along, along the river. Now, this is a, uh, it's, it's not, 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 not right, you know, in the sustainable design is totally not right. Why? Because the koi pond is not the natural habitat. It cannot sustainable due to it's a very human make. And in last year, September, uh, they have a fresh flood in happen in KL. And you can see, right, all the koi fish gone. They are totally gone. So you, you have to understand that this is still a drainage and it serves the function of drainage. And you just you put a point pond beside, right? It just it totally cannot work. Yeah. If you want to make it the river alive, you have to understand we want to create an environment or a habitat to the uh to the natures. So the natures will come by itself, not you put the pets on it. It's, it doesn't work. Yeah, they totally uh, fail. So I think this is a good learning curve uh, towards maybe it's not architects, maybe it's the politicians that like, they like coins. So they ask us to point a coin fish. So it totally, totally uh, fail. Now, another prison study in uh, Chongjian Chong in uh, Korea, actually this is uh, in the city center. And this is a uh, fight over. The, the government, they want to reverse thinking. They want to take off the flight over. Yeah, and put it back to green belt. Now, flyover is used to solve the traffic jam problem. But more flyover you build, the more traffic because you create the environment for the drive for the drivers. Correct. So if you don't, if you take out the flyover, means that you don't create the environment friendly to the drivers. Then you can solve the traffic jams because traffic jams the root problem is a lot of traffic. Correct, and. Flyovers always kills the business uh, uh, along, the, along the site, the business along the site, uh, because the people won't stop by. Yeah? So after the takeoff, and this is how it looked like today. Yeah? During the summer's time, so people really enjoy, people come over, and the business flourish. And this is uh, one of the successful projects, uh, infrastructure project as well. Turn the great infrastructure into the green infrastructure. Yeah. Now, this, the next one is the green architecture, create green space. When we create green space, actually we have a standard. Uh, in WHO, they have a standard uh, to recommend uh, us that uh, every, every capitals, you need at least 10 to 15 square meters. Yeah. So it means that, you, let's say it is in the PJ towns, you take the population, you take all the green area divided by the populations, and then that is what you get. Yeah, 10 to 15 square meter is the optimum, is a recommended. But when I study in Singapore, I I study if I, we, we study an area called Gerang. And this town, if they do not increase the green area, uh, in 2050, actually they only have 1.56 meter per person. So can you see how far is it? It's 10 times you know, lesser than what the WHO recommends. 
And I can foresee that in the future, the green area will become lesser and lesser due to the development and the population growth. Indeed, Singapore target in 2030, they want to remain at least eight meters square per person. Yeah. And we try to propose how, how can we push forward if you really want to follow the WHO, what can we do to the cities? So this is the assignments that I, I did in, uh, in the Singapore. And in the city, right, rooftop is the only way or is the best way for the uh, green creations. And if you look at, because in the towns or in the cities, there are a lot of uh, high-rise typologies. And in, in high-rise typologies, this is the area or this is a space that we can create a grid. Like, for example, the ground floor, yeah, take mo most, most of the ground floor area reserved for the green. And uh, the podium, and you can create a sky pot. You also can create the roof gardens. So this is the area that we suggested for a designer to create a green. And in the, a lot of the green assessment tools like GBI or Greenery, they allocate a, a credit to the green creations. And they use a calculation called green pot ratios. Yeah. And this is a case study, an Oasis Hotel Tower by Wuha. Uh, it's a high-rise typologies, but they, you know, they put all the plants on the facade. Now, architects like to do this, uh, but uh, when I show to uh, many developers or uh, facilities manager, they always ask the same questions, how to maintain the plants. Yeah. So I, if you want to do all this, uh, uh, creating green, we need some innovative solutions to the, um, to the developers or to the clients. We, we, we must convince them that this is a good for environment, but in the same time, it's practical, it's very effective because it's easily can cut out a lot of uh, heat, uh, you know, penetrate into your building and you can save a lot of energies. So we need to study the uh, holistic, holistic uh, benefits uh, of this kind of design. And also, we also need to understand what's the technical constraints if you want to apply this. Yeah. Now, this is the uh, green port ratio calculation format. I'm not going into this. Uh, I think you can learn it from, from the school or uh, in some courses. Uh, this is a uh, Marina Barrage in Singapore. It's the first green roof in this scale um, in Asia. If not mistaken, it'd be in Asia, not in the world, but in Asia. So the, the idea is whatever you take up from the land, you have to replace back. So the port ratio of green is one to one. So now, nowadays, right, we always recommend that, okay, can you achieve one to one uh, green replacement rate? Yeah, rather, because nowadays, um, when you do submissions, the authority will request 10% uh, of the green, this and that. So I think it's good that we use green port ratios so we know how much you've taken out and how much to replace back. And that should be the benchmark of a green design. Now, green architecture preserve the green space strategies. This green, this strategy is, uh, normally, this, normally this project is a minimum footprint. So the building will be a small scale. You cannot be a very giant building and Minimal, minimize disturbing the nature, you know, try to keep the natural assist and design follow the existing context. So the natures will be the lead and narrative of the design rather than the uh, architects itself or building, building itself and, and minimize the green whipping. Now, in order to do this right, we need to understand uh, the site data and site context. So we need to measure all the tree setting, all the tree location, the size and the type of the plants in order for us to design it accordingly. Yeah. And this is a Hu Tong Children Library and Art Center in Beijing. It's one of the you know, very beautiful uh, small building and the kids can play around with this old tree. You know, the tree grow to this size, it may take 50 years or even 100 years. So let the kids you know, play around, let them understand and have an interaction with the, uh, with the trees or with the natures. And this is how to uh, educate the new generations 
um, the importance of the uh, plantations. So plantations itself, not just a decorative elements for them, but it's a part of their life. And this is very important. So we want to create an implants in during their uh, childhood. And this another another's, um, project in a Palmer house, Alibra in India is a resort. So this project built around, around the coconut trees. Now, as you, as you know that if a mattress plantations, it will increase the properties value. So doesn't, doesn't it nice after you build the resort, right? You have all the mature trees around you. So this is, uh, this is uh, one of the examples. Uh, however, however, yeah, uh, the sad thing is we as an architect, uh, now I as an architect, we always, I always uh, ask people to keep tree, to do the green design, but this is my condo. My condo cut the tree, cut the tree, uh, I, as an architect or green, green architects, I'm not even can protect the trees in my condo. So it's a quite a shame. Yeah, we, we need to ask ourselves, you know, as an architect, how much, you, how much you can do in these systems? You know, why, why, why I can't stop them? Because in the law, there's no law to stop the management to cut off the trees. Yeah, because the trees is belong to the management. And uh, this is the... Um, this is a uh, well. They say this uh, they want to take care of the safety of the residents and this and this blah blah. So now I'm I'm still challenging in this case. I'm challenging them. Say the tree is is an asset. Yeah, it's not a decorative thing, but it's an asset belong to residents. So all the tree must be kept. And yeah, they they keep chopping down, and I keep a uh, protest to them. And on the right, on the on the left hand side is my friends. Uh, you know, nowadays you just pay a few hundred ringgit, you can call to Indon or Banga come over and they chop the trees. Even though this tree is not belong to the uh, to them, this is on the street. Yeah, I show you. You better stop. Or else I will really call police. Huh? You are not trimming the tree. You are chopping down the tree. Huh? This is very serious offense, I'm telling you. Huh? Yes, my friends are sent to me because uh, he... <laughs> She know I'm a green architect. I personally went there and I tried to stop them, but unfortunately they still cut off the trees. Yeah. So these are how the settings uh, we are now. And this it happened and happened again, you know, in, in our city. So I I don't know how many of us, you know, as a green architect, we we can do anything to, to protect our trees. So we need we need we need a systems uh, from the law side uh, as a designer. We also need to protect or to to educate uh, the public. Say you know when when the tree cut off, then there are many consequences. You know the soil erosions, uh, carbon footprint, etc. Uh, actually, I I actually I now I know that because because of this all these cases, I try to study what's the law that protect. Uh, now I know that if architects put the trees on the drawings in the submissions, right, and then the tree is, is considered as an asset. If your drawings do not draw the trees or the landscape that is a tree, then the management has the right to take it off because they say they know, don't know who putting the trees there. And now I know you can do something. Yeah, Draw a tree on the drawings and submit it together. And we will binding this asset to the residents. I hope it can help. So, so I, I, uh, you know, I encourage all the architects, our fellow friends, or our clients, um, try to look at these things seriously. I also actually I, I present this to the authorities. I present it to many authorities of these cases. I also hope the authorities can take action on this. Uh, when we call actually this. This case, we call the police 
uh, the police, they say this is a local authority matters and we call author local authorities. Local authorities say uh, they do not enough enforcement to stop them. Yeah, so this is a story behind. Wow, let's move on. So the next sustainable typology is a uh, energy design proactive. Now, pro proactive. What is a proactive means to use a lot of high technologies. Uh, normally, this kind of projects they have a self self generate energies, renewable energies, high tech devices, energy efficient envelopes that have a low E glass, double layer glass, all these quite, quite expensive things. Yeah, active control and management air conditioner systems. Now this this building is uh, called Structure Tower in London. They have a three nine meters wind turbines on the top of the building and are rated 19 kilowatt each. And it can generate 50 megawatt per year. And this is uh, equal to 8% of the total energy use of this building. Actually, 8% is quite a lot for the high-rise building. Yeah? And this building assists 13% of the current UK regulations and means that if, if you are GBI, right, we have a petroleum. This is even the 13% better than petroleum. So how good is this, you know, this, this project, structure tower in London. Now, however, this is a problem. It's been selected as a world's, world's 30th ugliest building. And residents hit the boiling points at the eco towers where the turbines don't turn. Noise fear could store structure turbines. Now, what, what, what's the problem? Because the three, these three giant turbines on the top of the building, when it turn right, the whole building shaking. Yeah, shake. And it create a lot of noise because it's a huge giant turbines. Now, imagine you are the dancery, you spend a few million pounds to buy a penthouse on the top. So your penthouse just below the wind turbine. Yeah. And when the wind turbine turns, you will hear vo, 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 vo. Now you're done Siri, right? Do you think you will uh, complain? Sure, you will complain. So the problem is when you complain, the management have to off the turbines. Now, another problem, when you off the turbines, because the whole M&E system, the whole design is factored in the 8% of the contributions. So when you off it, right? They do not have a surplus electricity to replace back. Means that during the summer, the aircon cannot function. Yeah. So if you have a, the, the internal temperature very high, so they call boiling points. Then this, this problem is make the manage, management very uh, awkward, you know, in the very awkward situations. Are you going to on the turbines or are you off the turbines? Now. What's it, what we learned from this case study is uh, sometimes it look good on paper. If it look good on the, all the scoring in the, in the platinum or gold credit, but we forgotten the buildings still designed or used by the stakeholders. So we need to take care the fundamentals of the well being, the fundamentals of how the people use the building. Yeah? But not just blindly for this uh, number because number doesn't tell you any consequences. The number is just a very uh, uh, straightforward, how much you produce, uh, how much you save, that's it. Okay. So now this is the zero energy building in BC Academic. BCA is a local, uh, it's called a, a housing, housing ministry, ministry in Singapore. So this is the first it's quite experimental building. It's the first zero energy building. Now zero energy doesn't mean that this building do not use energy. Just that this building, all the energies that use will be uh, offset by the renewable energies. So they call zero energy buildings. Now zero energy buildings, if you notice right, is only work in low rise building, especially you use uh, solar panels. Solar panels do not uh, performs well when you go for high rise. Now, why? Because the roof is the only area for solar panels. So the solar panels area, the roof area against the GFA will be decreased in percentage when the floor go higher. 
So it means that if you are more than four stories, right, the roof area against the GFA is only 3%. So how, what do you think the 3% solar panels can, can contribute to the, you know, to the whole building? It's not practical. Yeah, that's why a lot of high, you know, high rise building, you put a lot of solar panels. Um, I don't think that is uh, workable. Uh, at least in current technologies, it's not so workable. Uh, solar panels is only good for the low rise building. Having said so, if you do, you want to generate the renewable energies, it's not, uh, it's not the most important factors that you, you, you need to design because now, this is suggested by the USA Green Building Council. Before you really generate the energies on site, the first step you need to know, you need to do is how to reduce the energy consumptions. Without the reduce the energy consumptions, yeah, there's no point that you are you create more energies. Yeah, because you, you do not save money, you don't know how to save money. You have to earn a lot of money to, to support your own life. So, first of all, you need to know how to save the energy first, how to reduce the energy consumptions. And then the second step is you need to design the high performance envelope because most of the energies is used by the uh, cooling load, means the aircon. Yeah, you want to control the temperature internally. So all the heat is transformed from the outside to inside. That's why facade, roof, we call enveloped, we need the very high performance. The third step is appropriately designed systems. Before you do the online uh, on-site generations, uh, renewable energy generations, you need to really manage the internal systems. Like for example, you, you have a smart home systems, you, the sound system know where's the temperature is optimum temperature. So when, uh, when you're lower than this temperature, they will off the air con, you know, without the, without the uh, occupancy, the room will be take, will be taken off the, the light. So the systems, you need to appropriate design. And then the last step is the on-site energy production. Then the on-site energy production only workable. Yeah. So please don't forget the first, first three steps. Now, the last one will be the uh, energy design in passive design. Now, passive design what I what I think is the is a uh, uh, architects play a very important role. Active design engineers actually play a very important role because they are the one who design the M and systems. They are the one who recommends all the system to you. But passive design, no one can take over our roles as architects because we talk about orientations, we talk about the uh, no window opening, we talk about the natural ventilation as a trial. Uh, this is a prison study. It's a gold green toilet in, in Ippo, uh, designed by myself, okay? Passive design, designed by myself. And I use a, I use a word called climaticalism. Climaticalism means that we, we use the climate understanding or information as a narrative of the design itself, okay? Like for example, the, the sun angles. So we need to understand what's the sun angles during what time. So we can, we, we don't want to block the sun angles, uh, sunlight to the corridor. So we want, we want the corridor remain the brightness. And where's the wind direction from? So we know how to orientate the building or we know where to open the, the rovers, or open the windows, uh, as a trunk. And this toilet uh, actually, I do not design a full wall, there's no wall on, on, on this toilet, and this a uh, single pitch roof. So it's, uh, it's easier for rain, rainwater harvesting uh, because there are one, one directions, uh, corrections. Yeah, and then the pitch roof also uh, let the sunlight can penetrate to the corridor itself. Um, this is a toilet, or maybe you, you can't recognize it. So this is a toilet. It, because there's no land, no, no new land for, for the toilets, this is the only pocket garden we, we have. So we study the pocket gardens and we, we take care of the existing green. You know, we, attract, we minimize of the green whipping. And this is a gate. Yeah? Uh, so strange yeah? because the toilet is just built in front of the gate. It's the main gate, you know. And this is the guard house. 
So um, during the peak times, uh, all the students will, will come over. Uh, so this is the toilet that we designed. And this is the, this is the uh, photos that we taken just after completions. Now, when we, when we design the building, we can't just look at the uh, short terms uh, changes. We want, we want to uh, project what's the long terms uh, evolving of the building. Your building won't static. Yes, your building materials, your brick, your concrete will be static, but the environment won't be static. So are you going, are you get ready your building or the site, right? Let the plantation flora fauna to, uh, to, to survive or to adapt to your uh, building. Yeah. So, so I think as a young architects, uh, uh, you need to, to have more imaginations. Yeah, Sometimes when you, I, I know a lot of uh, students very good on Photoshopping or SketchUp, you put a lot of greens on the, on the buildings. Yeah. So it's, which is good. We need, we always need to take care of the green infrastructure. Think of what is the framework for this green to grow in the future. And it's a very simple building um, to have a two sides, two, a very narrow building as well, because we do not have uh, lots of space uh, and the basin in the center. Uh, I'll tell you why, uh, because, uh, because of the gradients, we want to recycle the waters. Uh, actually, the, the school built two identical toilets, no, identical toilets uh, without my consent, uh, but it still work, luckily. Yeah. One, of, one of the, another, another toilet is behind the classroom. So this is a classroom, this is a classroom, and this is a toilet, this is a storeroom. Yeah. And this is uh, after built. This, this toilet is uh, behind the classroom. So I show this photo is to let you see, right? You see how, how the sunlight quality is. Now this building is, is, is a storeroom. I think designed by our bank contractor. Yeah, it's one story also. This toilet also one story, but can you see the quality of the corridor because of this building, you know, do not have setback. The roof is designed, I mean, very conventional design. So it broke out all the light along the corridor and wow, well, this is almost forever. Now this, when you take care of the sun angles, right? You still can build one story high building, but we can remain the sunlight for the corridor. And this is the uh, entrance statements. Entrance statements, we do not have door. Yeah, do not have a gate or door for, for the toilets, no entrance door. Uh, and this tree is, is become uh, entrance statements. So we, we thought it's a very nice, you know, we how, how, how our building just sat beside the trees and we put the, we designed the entrance you know, near the tree side. So the tree is part of the statement of the entrance. And it's an internal view. The internal view during the daytime, you don't need to on any light. Yeah. And the no lip blower because it's so naturally ventilated. There are no smell contained inside. Uh, and no worry, this building only for male, only for boy is a boy toilet, not girl, not for girls. Yeah. So uh, the students, when they are do the business, actually they can they can look outside and the outside people also can see their face. Now, which is good. You know, the headmaster like it very much. They say, you no, know, after you after they use this toilet, no one bonding anymore. Uh, in the when we are young, we always we always skip the class and hide in the toilet and smoking. You know, <laughs> this toilet no way for you to smoke, no way for to, for you to hide. So it solves the discipline issue as well. Now, this is the sandal part. The sandal part is a basin. So this basin, when you wash your hand, uh, you use a gravity uh, behind that, the, the water will come up from here. Yeah, and then you flush the urinal again. So all the water you use here, you will use twice. And also we create a storyline for the students to wash a hand. You know, I, we, we know that especially boy, when they go to the toilet, they don't like to wash hand. Yeah. So we want to create this kind of the awareness and also we don't need, we don't need any energies to, to do this yeah. because of flush, keep flushing and this urinal can, can, you know, can maintain, can easily, I mean more easy, easier to maintain. And this roof tiles is a recycled roof tiles, uh, 70 years old. 
uh, recycled from the classroom because the uh, classroom leaking, so the, the school want to change the classroom tiles. Um, and then we collect back and we select all the good condition tiles and it's 70 years old. It's imported from the France. So very, a, a lot of history of this uh, house. It's good that now we are giving back the, you know, the new life. Uh, it continues to serve, the, to serve us as a roof house. And all the materials is very simple. We do not have a, a very complicated construction method. All the piping is exposed. So it's easier for maintenance. Any, any leaking, right? You can see it, then you can fix it. You don't need a very high tech things to fix it. Any, anyone, any locals, contractor that can do it and they don't need to paint. So it's a, it's a very uh, low maintenance building. Uh, on, on this movers, I design, I use, I design a different configurations. You know, we, we test what is the maximum uh, opening, but we have a minimum rain splashing in. Uh, so we use 60 degree because in Malaysia, actually the rain is 60 degree angles. But uh, we know that when you're strong, very strong storm rain right, in Malaysia is 90 degree. But 60 degree is good enough for, for this uh, uh, shading. So after we do all the configurations, and then we ask the contractor to customize it. And this is how it's looked at the back. Yeah, we, we, we will design the whole buildings uh, in front, the back, every single corner is uh, very, very refined or nice. Why? Because we, we thought that, you know, the cleaner, this is a cleaner work, work environment. And the cleaner storeroom is here. So we, we, we think of how the cleaner uh, do their jobs, how the, where the cleaner keep their back, you know, where the cleaner uh, rest. So I think all people deserve to have a good environment, a good working environment. Uh, I think the, 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 work, the, the cleaner like this toilet very much. So they, then they can uh, clean the toilets more often. Uh, yeah. So we want to make every, every corner uh, is a, is a uh, presentable and pleasant to use it. And these toilets have been wi widely uh, uh, reported in a local uh, newspaper. Um, what I see here is actually it's quite strange though, because non-energy toilets is not a new thing. 20 years ago, when we are young, we, we went to the Kampong, you know, visit our relatives. All the toilets there are passive design. So they do not use uh, you know, daytime, they do not use light, they do not pump. They even recycle the waste to fertilize their, their vegetables. So I just try to uh, copy or try to learn from our, our, our father generations and apply into the modern toilets. Now, this also, this, this also see the, the, the societies or the public mindset, right? is changing. Today, if you design a toilet or building with acorn, so there's a no, no one going to uh, interest on it because everywhere is like that. But now if we reverse thinking, we design something with nothing, then we, we can create something new to the societies. I think it's something good that this kind of a reporting can, uh, can create awareness to the public to say that the building without energies is the good building, is a better building than the building use a lot of energies. Yeah. Okay. So uh, end up, I already I, I humbly sharing what I know uh, during the during during my teaching, my research, and my career. So this is uh, what I present you uh, tonight: uh, sustainable design typologies. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's it. Uh, thank you, and um, yeah, welcome to any comments or you know any questions. And I pass the floor back to Kuma. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thank you, um, architect Ashley. Uh, that was a very interesting sharing indeed uh, about uh, sustainable design. I learned a lot of things on your uh, sharing tonight. Um, yeah, so if there is any questions, uh, I think we'll, we'll proceed to the Q&A session. Uh, so if there's any questions, you can type them in the uh, uh, the chat box in, in Facebook and we'll uh, bring it up for uh, AR actually to, to answer. 
Okay, there is one. Um, there is one question from Facebook. Uh, let me see. It says, um, okay. Uh, the questions on the solution of uh, inviting the natural uh, nature back is an interesting solution. But what if the middle of the urban uh, area, for example, KLCC, do you have any ideas to improve that? For his first question, and the second question is: Is the re renewable energy um, okay? Uh, if the re renewable energy cannot keep up with the uh, people's needs, what if in next fifty years, with the advance of uh, nuclear, nuclear power energy, the fourth generations or newer, do you think it is possible to overtake the active green design building? Right. Okay, yeah. uh, thanks for the question. These are, these are very interesting questions. Um, there are a lot of uh, negotiations in the cities. Like for example, KLCC, can we, can we bring the nature back? Actually, KLCC, the original idea is bring the nature back. If you know the KLCC at the back, they have a big green area reserved for the green, uh, which I think is a, is, a, is a right thing to do in the beginning. And and yes, they have made the most, uh, most of, I think mean 90% of the area in Kuala Lumpur uh, is not green. Uh, but we have a lot of precedents that can bring the nature back to the city. Like for example, Chinchongyang, Korea, yeah, just now I show you. Uh, this is a very good example to bring back the nature in the city center. Actually, this area is a, is a golden triangle. They, in, in Korea, they also call it golden triangle in this area. It's a very city center. It's something like KLCC. And another one is a, a, a Bush, Bishan Park. But you talk, talk about, talking about KLCC, right? I think it's nearer to these typologies. Now, if one day, one day, yeah, the flyover is not relevant. The road, the white road is not relevant because everybody can take public transport. Um, then we can consider to change the infrastructure from the gray infrastructure to the green infrastructure. So I don't know what is a natural, um, natural back you miss. So do you, the, do you mean that I want to bring back the monkey back to the KLCC or bring the otter back to a KLCC? If you want to do so, still, still can, still can, yeah? But first of all, we need to identify it how we do that and what is the potential in KLCC area we can do that. Infrastructure is something that we can look at, infrastructure. I think they do have a pilot project by Think Cities or Saxons, you know, they create a waterfall, they have a, they have a, a stream uh, near the, near the KL, KL center, I think KL site. That is a very nice ideas. The ideas for us, the idea is the natures and the city is integrated. So in one day, we want to blur the boundary of the natures and the uh, so-called the, the concrete bed or the or building itself. Uh, that is the that is the ideas for uh, most of the architects. I hope I can uh, answer your questions on that. Yeah, it's still possible. Yeah, it's still possible. Middle of an urban area is still possible. Now the second question is. Renewable energy cannot keep up with the uh, people needs. Yes, it's true. Um, I think the overall, the whole world now is only four or five percent uh, renewable energies. Uh, it keep increasing, but the percentage is very low. So you want to you know make up to fifty percent renewable energies. It may take a very very long time, and they have a lot of uh, uh, research say nuclear power. Uh, maybe it's a solution. Uh, one of the prominent uh, person who, who, who really work on this is the Bill Gates. Yeah, Bill Gates. Uh, Bill Gates, uh, he's he very interested on the new, you know, the next generation's energy. Uh, and he, he, he said the nuclear power uh, is a solution to, to our humankind. And after I, I study, yes, uh, but a lot of people still very worry, like Japan, you know, uh, they have a, a pollution of the nuclear uh, radiations and 
people still 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 don't understand how the nuclear work but i believe it's, it's like this everything has to evolve in the renewable energies in the same time also the nuclear power because the technology can solve the problem if we if we stop to exploring then we have no chance to solve our problem then it's better we stay what we what we are now the comfort zone then our we, we know how the trend is we know what's the ecological footprint going to be we know what's the population is going to grow so i think we need to we we, we really need to put our effort on exploring a new uh, solutions or framework you know to any single any single chance thank you for for your questions cool i hope that uh, answers your question okay the next question is um why do you think uh, proactive design is uh, more expensive than the conventional design oh very simple because you need to spend money on all these advanced technologies yeah uh no solar panels i don't know whether you know the price or not at the moment the the solar panels price is still very high and the roi we're looking for roi also the ROI is so low so yeah what do you think if the building with the solar panel and without the solar panel so the sure with the solar panels you you need more investments you need to buy the solar panel you need to do maintenance you need to rewiring the the whole mae systems so all is cost yeah so proactive design always more expensive than uh, passive design or normal conventional design this one for sure all right cool um all right uh is there any, uh, there's any more questions you can type them in the uh, chat box yeah but uh, meanwhile yeah i i do agree with the uh, the the one in korea the soul um that that the, the river i actually uh had been there at, uh last time when i was um when i was doing um what call it? uh volunteer work so yeah, I, I, I was quite amazed of this uh, river as well when I was just been here. And I yeah, think that... yeah, you see, if this water, I mean, originally, originally this is the drainage also. If this water in the drainage, drainage typologies, I don't think people dare to you know, touch the water or play around. But if the water in the landscape form, form then people will play around and this is safe and clean for the people. Yeah. But do you know that the two, actually the same water is actually totally the same water. Just because the habitat, just because the environment is different, right? So you make a very huge difference on how, how people preserve on the water and how the, how the quality of the water. Okay, it looks like we have a few more questions from Facebook. From Ji Ying, she asks, uh, uh, what if the client does not agree on the high budget generated by the building design, even when the benefits of the design is explained and is promising? Very good questions, very good questions. The first questions I ask that's why the client don't agree on the budget. Are you going to design something more expensive for them? Or you can design something low capitals, uh, initial capital building like passive design. Okay. So this is a misunderstanding of most of the developers or clients. They're very scared of green design. When you say green design, something in their head, right? Is a dollar sign. Oh, how much I have to spend more, how much I spend more. If you tell them green is an affordable movement, yeah, the first in the beginning, I, 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 I threw a question, right? Is green an affordable uh, movement? If yes, right, then we must have a way to design a green building with a lower cost, even lower cost. Like for example, the toilet, if, if we design a conventional toilet, I think easily more than what, what, what we deliver. And these toilets actually is under budget, even lesser than what the QS uh, uh, projected. 
So this is a proof that green building doesn't mean that more expensive. Okay, if more expensive, then I think it's something wrong. Why the one who want to save the planet have to spend more than the one who who to harm the planet? Correct. If if I want if I want to save the planet, I I drive the electricity car. Then why I want to spend more? Why the petrol car have to spend lesser? So what problem is it? So the one who actually you know harm the environment, pollute the environment, they have to pay more, not the one who save the planet. So I I think we we need to really strategize. Um, there are many many ways to design, right? That's why I come up with the. Uh, this chart hypothesis, this hypothesis to tell the client say, okay, Mr. Clients, not all the green design is expensive, you know. Some green design like preserve the green is not expensive. Just don't cut down the trees, but if you don't cut the trees, you even save more money. Like passive design, not expensive. Yeah, you do not add on all these equipments, even can lower down your cost. So if you can go through this design type projects, you keep a choice, okay, Mr. Clients. If you want a, you know, a good green design with a low low budget, yes, we have we have this approach. If you're willing to put more budget on the projects, yes, we have another approach, and it's also but all of these approaches is toward the green design strategies. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I hope. Uh, What's the question again? Just now, this is a two questions. Eh? Um, what if the client is not agree on the budget, and uh, even when the benefits of the design is explained and is promising? Hmm. Okay, explain. Now, um, a lot of clients looking for me is because they want sustainable design. Okay, I'm not approach them to sustainable design, but they they come to me say they want to a sustainable design, and how we convince them is you have to prove them, prove a lot of data. For example, you need to do simulations like if you did design, you know how much, uh, what's the light, what's the daylight quality you get, how much you save, uh, the light, um, how much you save the uh, the energy. Like for example, we design a factories, we design office. So we make the office right in the zone by zone, room by room, and space and separate it. So so we tell them that you need we can save energies. You only on the acorn when you use it or when this team use it. So you all the common corridor, the common area, non acorn at all. Yeah. So so this is to explain them how well you arrange the space, you know, to help them to save energies. And this is also part of the sustainable energies, uh, sustainable design. Uh, most of the time, the client don't convince is because we do not enough, we do not have enough data and fact to prove them. Um, your design is sustainable enough, and help uh, helping them to save money in long run or in the short terms. So we need to do a lot of uh, uh, research or site analysis or concept design, right? To, to make them understand, to convince them, to show the, uh, the proof. Because fact, fact never lie. Yeah, all these business, if you talk about big clients, they're all businessmen. They know how to do calculations. Yeah, they, they, are, they, they know how to read data. So please show them your uh, research, show them the simulation, show them the projections, show them the calculations. I believe you definitely can convince your clients. Interesting. Yeah. I hope that will help you in the future. Uh, um, next question is from Hazik. Um, he sees that uh, architects and developers are working um, sustainably on landscape, on housing projects. Why don't they apply it on the house instead? For example, nowadays there is no land or ground on the terrace house. I see there's also um, a lot of potential in the, to, to, the, to design the house into a greener and passive design. Well, these are very good questions, especially for terrace house. Um, recently, we, we have a call by uh, one big developers 
uh, call, call us to come up with a new ideas or new concept or how to redesign the terrace house. I think developers, I mean, in the, in the old days or, or commonly developers, they try to maximize the GFA. When they maximize the GFA, because this is a selling, right? This, the, the selling per square foot is, uh, is based on the GFA. So if you are developers, you are businessmen, sure you want to maximize the GFA. If you want to maximize GFA, then you will sacrifice all the green area, correct? However, the, the public uh, mindset is changing now. A lot of uh, big developers, if, you, if you're aware, um, they always use landscape to promote their products. Yeah, they say, oh, how, how big the, the, uh, the reserve forest, uh, how what is a green area you, you will get if you buy my product. So, so nowadays, I think developers, they also know um, using the landscape as a lifestyle to, to sell the product. And I believe that, I believe, uh, this question is very important. I believe there will be a new type project for Terrace House will coming out uh, in the common uh, house, housing estate project because I think that is a demand then that will be, uh, uh, how to say that there's a demand then people will, will, will sell it as it is or we design it. Yeah, because they have a, we believe that in future, the luxury, the luxury, right? Is not how, is not how big the house you own. It's how much green you own. Yeah, because uh, Big house is, is not a new thing. It's not something very difficult to, to, uh, to own it. But greenery, uh, landscape, nature is a very, uh, it's a very scarcity elements or items you own it in the future. Right, right. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So if you tell the developer, say, oh, if you have a green design or green passion in the green gardens in your terrace house projects, right? you can sell more, you can sell faster, you can sell higher price. But anyways, we need a public awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say it is the mindset uh, that needs to be changed? Mindset, also, but as a, as, a, as a designer, we also need to educate, educate and do some testing. Like for example, a lot of a condo nowadays, right? It's designed for aircon usage, not for passive design. Yeah, like casement windows. In the old days, we used louvers windows, but nowadays everyone designed casement windows. Now casement windows is not, um, not so sustainable design in our climate because it cannot control the, uh, the wind flow. Uh, louvers, we can control, you know, 100% close, 30% uh, open, uh, we can con control it. Uh, but casement, when you're raining, right, you will have to close the window, then you totally consume, con consume the whole unit. Means that you have to on the air corner, or otherwise you won't feel comfortable. So I think this, all these elements, right, we need to uh, rethink what kind of uh, uh, elements that we apply into our uh, design. And through this, right, we need to educate the developers, educate the clients, right? Uh, what is the right elements to apply? Mm. This is what we can, uh, we, this is our roles to, to tell them, you know. Right, cool. Uh, yeah, I hope that it, that answers your question, how's it? Okay, looks like, um, so we don't have any more questions from Facebook. Uh, I think for now, um, yeah, I don't think we have any more questions. So yeah, thank cool. you. Thank you, uh, Air uh, Architect Hoi, for your talk tonight. And thank you again for everyone for joining us uh, in this uh, online lecture series. Uh, we hope you guys enjoyed it and gained a lot of um, information uh, and knowledge and also insights. So yeah, do keep it. Keep in touch with our MASA's Instagram and Facebook for the next online lecture. Uh, this lecture is also uh, recorded um, and the video link in the, uh, will be posted uh, in our Facebook and Instagram and uh, also Facebook. And lastly, um, if you haven't already done 
than yet, you can also register for PAM membership at www.mypam.org.my. Uh, there are a lot of uh, ben benefits for architecture students. Okay, so again, thank you everyone, and thank you, Erhoi. Uh, Until then, uh, have a nice night, and we'll uh, catch you guys next time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can stop the... Offering?